Well, good afternoon and good evening to all the speakers and participants in this special global conference organized by the World Academy of Art and Science and United Nations Office at Geneva and many of our multiple partners. We're thrilled to be here today to speak on the very important topic on science, youth and education and have an exquisite panel uh, for you. I just want to say hello to all of our global participants today and I'm very eager to hear all of your questions and all of your engagements today during the discussion portion. We will have um, four very powerful presentation. We're going into a more conventional mode to have enough time for our speakers to present on their topics, on their proposals and strategies, um, but also we will have enough time uh, to have your questions addressed and to engage you as best as we can in this virtual domain. I am Mila Popovic, and I am a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science, head of the research and development of the Global um, Leadership Project, that is Global Leadership in the 21st Century Project by UN Geneva and World Academy of Art and Science, which brings us today to this conference. I'm also chair of the nominations committee and member of the executive committee, also a founder and director of Evolving Leadership, uh, program and practice uh, for transformational leadership. I am thrilled to be here and to lead this panel and to feature today uh, our distinguished fellow, um, Dr. Nebo Shaneshkovic, who is the Secretary General of World Academy of Art and Science, um, also a prof longtime professor from the University of Belgrade and head of multiple programs at the famous Institute in Serbia. Uh, we have with us um, very shortly uh, Dr. Faris Kapitanovic, professor of University in Sarajevo, and he's also wa was fellow. Uh, we have Alexander Scheifer, co-founder of Transfor M Center for Integral Development and Home for Humanity, as well as Dr. Asim Kuriak, Professor Kuriak from Sarajevo School of Science and Technology, a truly global mm -hmm. panel. I am going to go forward and give just a couple of introductory words about the beginning of the world of Ac Academy of Science and its very own foundations. We have pre we've been preoccupied about the question of responsibility, social responsibility of science. And today with this panel, we are indeed within these new global conditions, rethinking the role of science, rethinking the most effective ways it can be engaged for the benefit of humanity, and to help us face global challenges. So today we are indeed speaking about responsibility of science, new roles of science, and most importantly, new ways in which science can mobilize global leadership for uh, global transformation and ways in which we as scientists, as artists, um, as intellectuals can respond and the way we can support humanity to respond to its own challenges and to evolve into the new paradigm of human development. It is my pleasure indeed to open the panel and I hand the word over to Dr. Nebo Shaneshkovic uh, and uh, have him introduce himself and take over um, with the presentation, which we've agreed upon to be up to 10 minutes and engage you, dear viewers, in discussion. Thank you, Mila. Hello to everybody. And the title of my contribution, my brief contribution, will be on the necessary unity of global and national approaches to science and technology. And I will be talking about two huge scientific organizations, uh, global organization. The first one is the European Organization for Nuclear Research, very well known as CERN. And the second one is the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research. These organizations are considered as the most successful global organizations in science and technology. CERN, the former Agban organization, is the largest laboratory for particle physics and nuclear physics in the world. It was founded in 1954, a long time ago, but 12 European states and it is located in the vicinity of Geneva at the Franco-Swiss border. Today, CERN includes 23 member states and eight associate member states. Over 600 research centers and universities around the world are using the CERN facilities. 
1956, 11 states founded the Joint Institute in Dubna, Moscow region, Russia. Currently comprises 18 member states and six associate member states and collaborates with more than 800 research centers and universities from 62 states worldwide. The Joint Institute is one of the largest research centers in the world devoted to particle physics, nuclear physics, condensed metaphysics, but also radiation biology. CERN and the Joint Institute have been successfully demonstrating advancement and excellence in science and technology on the global levels for more than 60 years. Besides, they have been providing the cultural bridges between numerous states worldwide and enabling them to successfully practice diplomacy through science. The cooperation between the member states with the two organizations is going on via groups of scientists first from the states integrated in the two organizations projects, but also companies from the state specialized in accelerator and nuclear technologies, delivering goods and services to the organization that is providing the industrial returns to the states from the organizations. Such a two-way uh, uh, cooperation should ensure continuous concrete contributions to both scientific and technological developments of these states. This is something holding these states together in a long period of time. However, one of the problems the two organizations have is the industrial returns of less developed member states being often small or very small relative to their membership fees. There is a collaboration towards CERN, but not backwards. There is no or very small industrial return. And that makes the memberships of the two organizations not stable and in the long term, non-sustainable. But there is a solution for that or suggestion how to solve the problem. The proposed effective long-range solution is to initiate and support development of an application of accelerator and nuclear technologies in these states by establishing national or regional accelerator or nuclear facilities with scientific, technological, medical, and or educational profiles. These facilities ought to be constructed and upgraded. This is very important with considerable participation of companies from these states. The expected benefit of the solution is the appearance of companies specialized in accelerator and nuclear technologies in these states, which would be able to increase, first of all, their industrial return from CERN and the Joint Institute. But also these companies can appear in the world markets with, with the good references from the two organizations and competitive production programs. On the other hand, on the side of the two organizations, their memberships would become more stable and their attractiveness for other states would increase definitely. Clearly, to, uh, leading clearly to intensifying and enrichment of global cooperation in science and technology. This has been a general story and it is valid for almost all smaller states in these two organizations. But let me be also concrete and a proposal, a concrete proposal along this line is going out to the government of Serbia. The proposal is to approve uh, the realization of the so-called CB project in Belgrade, in Serbia, which is focused on research development and education for the fourth industrial revolution. And the project was launched in March this year. The aim of the project is to complete the construction of the so-called Serbian iron beam infrastructure. It is a large facility in the Vincha Institute of Nuclear Sciences in Belgrade, whose programs of use are focused on uh, a, a number of fields, material science, 
radiation research in biology, chemistry, and physics, physics of thin crystals, neutron physics, but also on proton therapy and on production of radio pharmaceuticals for diagnostics and therapy. The education is also included, and as I have said, all that is focused on the fourth industrial revolution. The acceptance of this proposal, it is a long story in Serbia. The construction started a long time ago, but the Vincha Institute has been pushing that for years to complete the endeavor. The acceptance of this proposal and its successful implementation would be an additional proof that a dialectical unity of nationalism and globalism is the necessary basis for advancement and excellence on a wide front in research, development, and education. I'm repeating, nationalism plus globalism. These are the opposite, but they help each other. The development of science on the national level depends on the development on the global level and vice versa. That would definitely make the acceptance of that proposal, the membership of Serbia in CERN and the Joint Institute sustainable in a long term. This has been my contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nebosh. I really appreciate this focus on uh, combining the resources and perspectives, which really is lined up with the World Academy's motto of unity and diversity in knowledge, as well as in participation in power, in civic participation, in democratic pro processes, as well as in educational processes. So um, without um, going deeper into this discussion, as I think there will be a lot to address uh, from your powerful presentation that is basically covering ways in which we can transform existing institutions as well as existing relationships. Um, and I really appreciate that. I am going to um, invite um, Dr. Faris Kapetanovic to uh, join us and uh, give his presentation of up to 10 minutes. Uh, so that we can engage in dialogue. Welcome, Faris. Make sure that you unmute yourself. We are eager to hear from you. And um, if you um, can go into the lower left corner of your entire screen and click on unmute that mic. Or in the um, in where you see your own picture, if you can go up to the upper right hand corner, there is a blue box. Uh -huh, blue. Okay. We can hear you now, sir. You were muted yourself again. Click again and just be patient yeah. for a second. Thank is it you okay? so much. We hear you is very okay well, now? sir. Absolutely. Welcome. It Thank takes you. a second for the for the signal. Uh, there might be a delay, but we are here and eager to hear from you. Welcome and um, join the panel, please. We are eager to hear your presentation. Thank you, Mila. Uh, thank to, to all, dear participants and colleagues. The World Academy of Art and Science decision to organize in collaboration with the United Nations Office at Geneva a conference titled. Uh, uh, as uh, a strategies for transformative uh, global leadership uh, comes in the right time following uh, all uh, challenges uh, and the lessons human uh, kind received recently as a consequence of outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic. Even today, as we speak, uh, evident voyage uh, of virus COVID-19 continues even though it is the first wave have passed through Southeast Asia, European countries and partly in Northern America. However, the situation is far from over and still worrying as number of affected and raising in most of the South America and USA is still struggling to ease their numbers. Unfortunately, we still do not have relevant information for the African countries. Uh, therefore, pandemic is far from the over, but with the already seen lesson, this conference becomes very timely. One important fact that especially need to be pointed uh, out throughout the Corona-19 crisis that is that the virus has, virus has the most severe blow to the generation that made foundation for added value of our civilization, 
people that are now in their late 70s and uh, 80s, such as effect is largely neglected, but is important to take into serious consideration as might it have important social uh, repercussion. Uh, actually, one important fact that especially needed to be point out throughout the Corona-19 crisis is uh, uh, probably have the most severe consequences on other generation. This is the generation of our youth. We are faced with the new everyday reality. Many scientists keep on stating that civilization we need to learn to live with the corona. What does it mean? Only masks, frequent and detailed cleaning of hands, continuation of physical and hopefully not social. Uh, our new generations, teenage, teenagers, those in early 20s face with the fragility of our civilization and awareness that total change of life can happen in a week or two will grow with such a notion. One cannot uh, understand or foresee magnitude of the importance of that fact in their lives and their perception of the world. For an example, just a small change in learning system, uh, lack of physical presence of teachers, the body language, the, somebody says that the body language, language is almost 85 percentage all uh, what the students or pupils are receiving during the lectures is now, as I can say, uh, lose. Uh, and their generation can definitely cause clear distance in understanding and overall perception of the subject and teaching process. Therefore, in this part of our course, to address some of the most important issues that should uh, resemble one of the worst post-virus reaction. One is a fear. Uh, second is, is immediate response that each country is on its own and uh, will deal with the virus individually. And the third flow of power, powerful, fast spreading fake news have to be on one forefront of our consideration. One of the positive side coronavirus is showing us when humanity is united in common cause, phenomenally rapid change is uh, possible. None of the world problems are technically difficult to solve. The originate in human disagreement, COVID-19 demonstrate the power of our collective will when we agree on what is important. What do we want to achieve and what world shall we create? Uh, that is always the next question when anyone awakes to their power. Therefore, is, it is becoming very clear that the world is faced with pressing challenges and need for open, honest, and strategic direction, solutions, and decision for world future while seeking right leaders to do it. Those have to be found, educated, and encouraged within our scientific uh, youth based on altru altruistic belief in humankind as a whole. In the current uh, coronavirus emergency, the coping efforts are mostly directed to the containment of the spreading of the pandemic, confining uh, people to their homes, restricting social and economic activities, activating emergency fiscal and economic support to individuals, small and medium enterprises, etc. cetera. Uh, while schools and uh, universities are offering traditional online courses to their students. This reaction was of profound importance as it helped many of the school age children generations to hang on to some kind of the routine and deal with the lockdown more easily. Mm -hmm. However, uh, this change came with a price. Fact that many of the school kids as well as university students could follow their lectures and classes in the pajamas brought a new realization to their mind, including resistance to return to the formal classes. In addition to this uh, socialization uh, of should we call them Nintendo or PlayStation generation has brought and formed new ideas and bonds of uh, friendship virtual one. Are we about to face uh, dying of social exchange as we knew it in the late 60s of 20th centuries? Most definitely, but uh, what is going to replace that? What will be concept of friendship? If uh, any, are we going to have a, a 30 year from now new generation of close individuals 
incapable of social exchange? And if so, what will be the consequences to the concept of society as a whole? Science therefore becomes a major role player in the future of society as a concept, not only in lab science that will hopefully produce medicine for COVID-19 or any mutated version to come in addition to this social science needs to, to step up and create role models, answers and solutions to uh, ever growing number of social additions, issues and distancing uh, that might become one of the effects of post-corona societies. Therefore, there is no dispute that our look ahead, our visions, our tasks will need to look into ways to identify and encourage most potential leaders of today, youth to step up, take this responsibility, embrace proper science based, based on identified facts and not semi-conspiracy theories that spread fear, lockdowns and mistrusts. It is now more than ever in our recent history that uh, truthful, honest and brain information, knowledge and scientists have uh, to come to the first line, not first line of defense as it will be too late as Corona-19 showed us, unfortunately. In many countries, even the most developed one, uh, ones, but the first line of progress, vision and hope. Our education system needs to promote and look for those who will defend the truth and not political agendas, those who will recognize and protect the whole well-being and progress and not save comfort uh, zones of ignorance and fear, those who will strive for better and more based on clear goals and not those who will run the world based on their individual business interest or those who finance them. This is uh, for this realization and the time for this is now. This realization has to include as I actually uh, point this, recognize impor important, long lasting and profound effects and impacts of Corona-19 virus. Know that effects will go beyond only health uh, issues. Believe that important lessons need to be learned and overall practices changed uh, throughout societies and world, especially in our individual and collective health system. And remain as I uh, stressed and focus on committed to global exchange of knowledge, experience and best practices in order to preserve and improve health and well-being of a world population. Convinced that proper education and upbringing based on altruistic, equal for all and truthful approach where key are uh, key and improved role will be given to teachers. We would like to suggest that our efforts also focus on role and importance new formats of education and teaching in order to avoid clash between improved technologies and virus uh, forced need to stay home. Once again, thank you very much for your kind invitation and expressed interest in my contribution for e-conference on strategies for transformative global leadership. I wish all of us productive and result-based conference with best wishes to all uh, of you today. And perhaps uh, later on, we will speak uh, a little bit more about all these issues we will uh, point uh, earlier. Thank you very much and greetings to all, thank you. Thank you, Faris, and if you don't mind, mute yourself only temporarily because we're gonna give the, the space, the speaking space to um, our other speakers and uh, to preserve us from any background noise. Um, thank you very much for um, painting the picture of us of what the learning is gonna be like in the time of the pandemic. So the learning in the time of pandemic and also focusing on the overarching topic of this panel, as well as of the entire project on global leadership in the 21st century, which is the new process of social learning. What are they going to be like? We have never had um, an opportunity to connect some dots and now have to work from very informal spaces, very private spaces and connect them to um, institutions that have the resources and the know-how of which Nebosha spoke. So in the spirit of the friendship that you call us to and question, um, I am addressing you all by your first name, which is a custom in the World Academy yeah, of Rocket okay, Science yeah. as well. So um, I am going to now, um, first of all, point one thing to you that we have a very diverse panel and you will hear uh, uh, an array of perspectives. For example, Nebosha comes as a physicist, 
Faris comes as a medical doctor, and we are now moving towards two presentations that are expanding or zooming out even more of, on, a, on a macro of profoundly uh, a personal and a broadly uh, macro perspective of transformation in science and the processes of learning. In that spirit, uh, we are moving on to Alexander's presentation. Uh, once again, Alexander Schieffer is the co-founder of Transform Center for Integral Development and Home for Humanity. Alexander, welcome. Thank you, Mila, and thank you, and greetings to my colleagues and you friends on the panel. And I'm delighted to be here, and I also want to build on the wake-up call that we just heard from Paris for a new kind of science and education, and prior to that from Nebosia. I want to out myself or position myself as an educational and scientific activist for social innovation and societal renewal. And hence the title of my um, presentation, my opening remarks is about transformative education for transformative global leadership, which is the overall topic of the um, the, the conference in these five days. And I would like to lead you to four different steps. I want to make a claim that many of today's educational institutions are not designed to generate transformative global leadership and leaders that what we are looking. And I want to speak briefly about what I see as the systemic fault lines. But I want then to move on to a trans, if a transformation of education takes place, it can not only generate transformative global leadership, but it can also be, as I believe, the vital lever, leverage for the much required large system change. And I will then move number three to some of the applications in the work of I'm doing and end with the accelerator that I see, which is a new kind of learning to innovation compass which I would like to say. And I would like, as my previous um, speaker, Faris, to locate it also in our time. And because this is the Academy of Arts and Science, um, which is co-hosting this event, I want to start with a poem that I've written two weeks ago, and it's called I Can't Breathe. Today, we stand as brothers, and brothers is brothers and sisters. Today, we stand as brothers, feeling the pain of others, freeing our hearts from ice, bred out of hubris, born from sacrifice, grown over 100,000 years of violence, injustice, fears. It's time to pierce through all this suffocation it's time for tears of true reconciliation. It's time for justice, healing, peace. Time for a world where all of us can breathe. So when we talk about education today, I witness a lot also in deep contact with the young people of our time that many can't breathe in our educational environment. It doesn't liberate the spirit for social change. And the key question I want to ask as we look into systemic fault lines, I do that very quickly. Why is so little social innovation coming out of our universities and schools? A lot of technological innovation, yes, but social innovation, societal renewal is actually very inhibited. And very briefly, I would argue it is because our education primarily is informative, but not transformative. It's degree oriented, but not social change oriented. It's content and frontal driven pedagogy versus liberating process oriented pedagogy that creates learning ecologies for change. Fragmentation of knowledge is what we witness in most of our educational institutions versus transdisciplinary knowledge creation, which we need to address the complex issues we are facing. The course orientation doesn't help either. It fragments knowledge even further. Rather, we need to create learning journeys. Most of our educational institutions are out of touch with the burning societal issues that we are facing. We are equipping people for jobs in the existing system rather than that we develop innovators that can renew or even create new systems. And one very important point 
often underlooked, our educational systems are basically monocultural. And monocultural is they have a very strong Western imprint and they simply, and I work a lot in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, do not bring sufficient local knowledge into the equation. And hence, many people around the world in education can't identify and connect that knowledge to their own societies. One could also say many of these societies can't breathe when it comes to bring their own knowledge base in. Hence, I would argue, and then you see, of course, around the world, these decolonization of education movements that are expressing exactly this dimension. So where do we move systemically? What kind of design principles are needed for a new education in order to make it transformative? I would say on the one hand, and most importantly, education would need to be oriented towards future building, not towards past preserving. It needs to be life-centered to be dealing with the full complexity and uncertainty we are facing. It would need to be whole systems oriented, transcending knowledge fragmentation. And that also would need, mean that we need to build more collaborative learnings and also knowledge creation systems, you know, that we invite larger arrays, not only in the university or school, but also in society into the production of knowledge. It would need to be whole world oriented. All voices of the world, all knowledge voices needs to come to the um, epistemological table. For me, this is a make or break also in our shared journey. And when I look at the, uh, Mila, you said it beautifully, it's about unity and diversity. A civilization of unity and diversity requires that we begin with that exactly in our universities. In order, however, to equip our young people, and I want to build on my colleagues who spoke before, we need an education also that is whole person oriented. We need to work with people on this inner development to see life in a new, more holistic way. And that requires a process uh, and person oriented pedagogy to which unfortunately many of us in universities are not equipped. Um, and this is an important work to be done. And then I would, uh, there is much more to say, um, conclude this part with that degrees shouldn't be given mainly on recapitulating knowledge that has been conveyed, but primarily, I would argue, based on the social innovation that a learner has impacted in his or her society. So we bring society in. But then how do we develop such learning to innovation journeys meaningfully? And I want to share a couple of examples from my own practice. We have on the one hand developed a global PhD. We call it and we dub it uh, half jokingly, PhD, a process for holistic development. So people come and they come with the burning issues that they face in their local context, be it in Africa, be it in Sri Lanka, be it in, in Jordan, all countries we work extensively in. And they only also do not come as individuals. They come with their organization or community and take these learning, build learning ecologies that co-own the knowledge production process and co-own the translation of the innovation into the new practice so that the PhD journey isn't over after the three years or four years of PhD, but it continues. And when we come to the end, we don't have the classical viva. We also have that where you demonstrate the new knowledge, but we also have um, a community viva where the people who have worked with a person on the social innovation represent collectively uh, this new work. And I can share when we have more time examples about that. One other example I would like to bring in, I have a lot of young people coming, oh, can we please, um, can you um, be the supervisor of my bachelor thesis or my master's thesis? And I say, I'm not a supervisor. I think this is a concept of the past, but I can be a co-creator of knowledge. If you are, want to align with this kind of more holistic integral education and learning production uh, principles that I shared, then I can help you to find, according to your own learning and innovation passion, an environment in which you can actualize. So I send my young people around the world to partner organizations who are cutting edge in terms of 
representing pioneering role models of education, but also of new practice, of enterprise. And I lodge them in there, and there they are creating their transformative bachelor or master's theses, be it in India, and I have one here, a young man who created with a fascinating school in Mumbai an approach a holistic approach to education. This is a bachelor thesis of a 21-year-old person effecting profound social change and participating with an entire organization in developing a new curriculum. In Jordan, and this is the last case I'm sharing, this is school, an entire school, initially for girls, now also for boys. Perhaps one of the most innovative schools I've seen in the Middle East um, and which have embraced a holistic educational paradigm working closely for us for many years. This school is now, has taken an initiative on which is called Tanwir. In Arab, it means enlightenment. This school says we have a role to play to transform the educational system in Jordan and in the Middle East towards a new phase of enlightenment. You remember the Arab phase of enlightenment 8th to 12th century, they're reconnecting to their own cultural roots to transform their own education system. This is the kind of work that is possible. And I, in a close conclusion, often imagine if our schools, kindergartens, universities, each would address the burning issues in their own particular context and gear education in a way that it can transform people and communities and societies, we would have an entirely different world and we have a leverage here at hand that is um, hard to find otherwise. In conclusion, I would like to speak a minute about Home for Humanity because I have often thought, dear friends and colleagues, of how do we bring this change into the universities, into schools, and of course, we are all aware that these systems change very, very slowly, not fast enough for the change that we need to see. We need to build, I believe, alternative environments, learning ecologies. Home for Humanity near Geneva is one where we bring our PhDs, where we bring uh, students from the University of St. Gallen for intensive courses of rediscovering learning in a new way and making a practical contribution to society. This is um, one way how we experiment with new forms of learning ecologies, and we are now connecting about five to six different learning ecologies across six, uh, six continents, working together to focus on the development of a new generation of what we like to call world makers, young people who want to change the world. And we are calling this constellation um, a humaniversity, not a university, it's a humaniversity. And the Earth in the middle, you have to read as the planet Earth. So education that makes a contribution to our planet, to the issues of our time, so that everyone can not only breathe, but freely uh, develop and make his or her unique contribution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. I mean, leaving us in the space of contribution um, and conscious contribution is very significant. And most importantly, that you, um, like you said, you, you are looking at the systemic um, fault lines in order to drive us towards the new phase of social innovation and social regeneration, which is very important, as I mentioned, connecting to a whole new process and developing a whole new process of social learning. Uh, and isn't it fascinating that um, there's a profound and broad synchronicity that just happened that we had one 15 year old last year uh, refusing to go to school and standing in front of Swedish um, you know, capital in, in front of the government saying, I will be an army of one if that's what it takes to have the voice of my generation heard, a planetary voice, only to see that like Faris pointed out, we're all now pausing and having to stop and not going to school, certainly not in the same way, and not willing to go to school in the same way. And you pointing out also that the, the youth um, needs co-creators and co-learners supporting, 
support in learning. They need to be hosted in the, on this planet properly and supported. I have heard a comment uh, yesterday in our conversation at the beginning of the conference um, where one of interested participants was asking, um, I hope he was asking, if indeed the youth is lacking leadership skills. Um, I hope that wasn't a statement but more of a question because we know for, for a fact that they're not lacking leadership skills that have shown to us that we are lacking ways of supporting emergence of their purpose and their leadership and they took to streets they took to schools in every possible way that they could and if you look at our other panels and the panel that preceded this one today was all star-studded with youth leaders from all over the world that is absolutely amazing to learn from and i've heard recently a young man in college uh, warn me that the era of personality is over this is the time of community and education that's what the, these are the messages their messages to us so um, are these adults and uh, leaders that are already in positions and resourceful positions of leadership and institutional need, need to grow up and mature onto the next level of purpose development and potential development of our students, of our children, of our friends, and of all the planetary beings that we are hopefully becoming. So with that sense of responsibility and the capacity to respond, I turn it over to Asim. Asim, welcome to the panel, and we're eager to hear. Uh, Asim is a professor of the Sarajevo School of Science and Technology, and I have the top panel of representatives from the Balkan countries, and I'm excited to join you today and to hear what's happening at the intersection of East and West, as Alexander actually happened to bring us perspectives uh, from all over the world. And excited to listen to you, Asim. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Mila. Good morning, members of panel. And in particular, good morning, virtual participants. I am doctor of medicine. And my friend Faris just nicely outlined together with almost all of you catastrophic influence of pandemic corona virus. I'd like to offer two little bit different <coughs> conclusions. First of all, medical problems are not most important. 600 years ago, city in Croatia, country where I'm living now, Dubrovnik introduced quarantine. 600 years ago, the most successful therapeutic approach today. We have le to learn something from that. However, for me, the main problems are lack of solidarity and lack of leadership. That's why I did concentrate on the modern requirements for the scientific leadership and how do we respond on these requirements. History knows that these two gentlemen, you know, became true leaders and uh, we have to learn many things from them. But the idea is that all the society is old. Plato said that someone who commits himself and is trained for a life of service and devotion to fellow citizen. And Peter Drucker in several of his books said, Leadership without direction is useless, uninformed by ideas about what is good and bad, right and wrong, worthy and unworthy. It is not only inconsistent, but dangerous. As the pace of change in our world continues to accelerate, strong basic values become increasingly necessary to guide leadership behavior. Even Immanuel Kant said, that the concept of the categorical imperative, this perhaps forbidding phrase, means that we should treat each other as ends and not simply as means to advance one's own or an organization's interest. Categorical imperative, we shall see, is one of the core ethical concepts in forming leadership. There are, however, two groups of people, two big and different groups of people, leaders and administrators. Leaders will set a vision, encourage and motivate, manage change and inspire. Leadership is above all capability to influence behavior of people, including their value system. And it is about commitment 
and commitment is about values. Leaders create vision and make people follow them while administrators plan, organize and supervise the, their teams. Administrators are susceptible to rules and regulation based on experience. But unlike leaders who want to experiment, innovate, explore and reinvent, leaders expect initiative and make people fight for vision while administrators distribute those and expect obedience. Furthermore, leaders are accessible to risk and infrequently engage in conflicts. Leaders receive cooperation without even asking for it. And the leaders are needed to alter the course, to innovate and take chances. Administrators, however, keep the system running while leaders save it from failing in times of transition. Leaders are explorers while administrators take paths already established, they are more reproductive, since most present day systems and organizations are fully immersed in change, we need the leaders, promoters of the new set of values instead of administrators, fighters for the status quo. This is very important to remember. The goal of education and training is to pro provide us with better output, as Alexander pointed out. So instead of bosses and teams appointed by senior management, we need a system in which the leader is a person who calls the meeting and people show up and teams are self-selected. Instead of goal attainment being based on command and control, we need an organizational environment in which everybody is responsible and all control is based on self-control. I am all for change, but don't change me, change everybody else. And as Tom Peters pointed, if you want a paradigm shift, it is not enough for the old professors to retire. They must die. Leadership in medicine, where I do belong, is it, uh, should be based on values that provide appropriate direction for the use of institutional power and authority. Few words more about that. Medicine is not primarily business, but the business aspect of medicine must be managed competently. Excellence in patient care, education, and research should be the goal of medical leadership. Though medical leadership have a little bit different requirements. So the challenges physician leaders confront today call to mind Odyssey's challenge to steer his fragile ship successfully <clears throat> between Scylla and Haribda. The modern Scylla takes the form of ever increasing pressure to provide more resources for professional liability, compliance, patient satisfaction, central administration, and the host of other demands. Components of leadership are management, knowledge and skill, very important, and physician as professional. Physician leaders bear major responsibility to shape organizational culture that support the fiduciary professional, professionalism of physicians. And because healthcare organizations now play a central role in patient care, their moral culture and therefore physician leaders have become vital elements in physicians being able to maintain their professionalism. Some of classic depiction of virtues as shown from Sistine Chapel and four professional values, virtues in medicine from Gregory's medical ethics are self-effacement, self-sacrifice, compassion and integrity. Self-effacement in leadership one's own speciality or subspeciality, one's friends and colleagues, and one's gender or ethnicity. Uh, but unbiased regarding one's own speciality or subspeciality, one's friends and colleagues, and one's gender or ethnicity. Reasonable risk to organizational interests should be. Bottom line mentality is a problem, not a solution. Economic success means to fiduciary professionalism, not end in, in itself. Reasonable risk to self-interest 
income and job, job security. Compa compassion is recognized and respond to colleagues' professional distress and routinely ask, what can I do to help? Management decision according to standards of intellectual and moral ex excellence, sound and balanced economic judgment for integrity. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm leading uh, one world Academy of Science of uh, Perinatal Medicine, 142 countries with 28,000 members are involved in this. We've been invited by Secretary General of United Nations to speak about Women and Children Fest and presented declaration and gave to him one of the concrete steps in our leadership duties. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, to finish up, only leaders, true leaders, trained through global education, and the only proper education nowadays is global education, as Alexander stressed out. More than ever, we need creative leaders. Are we ready to discover them? I have a proof that true leader, creative, innovative leader starts in utero. We don't have methods to, to discuss fetal behavior, to discuss fetal remembering, fetal uh, crying and many other things. We know that many chronic diseases do start in utero, like the main killer, cardiovascular disease, and so on. However, who will take us from this pandemic? Leaders of two most powerful countries, you know, in the world, did not show much creativity and lack of leadership and even more lack of solidarity among us is a problem to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Austin. First of all, thank you for highlighting wonderful qualities and values of, of authentic um, and truly supportive, compassionate and self-giving leadership. Not only did you highlight those and put those in the forefront, but you also connected those values across domains from medical field, what it means to take care of one's mental and physical state from teaching to medical field to corporations, that it is actually the same qualities that permeate development of, of humanity and people that constitute the classroom and the hospital and the community and the corporation, as well as a nation and, and uh, our species at large. And finally, you have also called us on the responsibility of, at this point, um, international governing body of the UN and trying to revive the initiatives within the UN, which has been, which was delivered some severe blows exactly um, in terms of funding and support itself. And one of the parts of this project on global leadership is in exactly to find those institutions that have a true broad uh, mission that we can lean on. What are some of those inter international institutions such as UN that we need to revive, reinfuse with new energy and new purpose, renewed purpose for the 21st century, connect them with the movements and the social movements and regenerate that process, that feedback uh, loop in which they can inform of each other's uh, capacities and purpose. I think you have really opened up the field for that discussion and, and kind of gave us a summative um, moment uh, from all of these presentations where, um, you know, Alexander connected us on, an, on, on a kind of a vertical axis between deep personal transformation onto the kind of universal um, re regenerative movement where we had Faris contextualizing us into the COVID-19 pandemic situation and how to learn now and how can we learn together to Nebusha basically speaking about what it means to learn across nations, across regions, across institutions, and how to repurpose these institutions and use their resources in a meaningful way. But also, as Alexander said, decolonize the knowledge. I think it's very well connected to what Nebusha is speaking and what are these unique perspectives that at one point might have been harmed um, or devalued that need to come back and how we can now um, you know, speak from our own contexts 
speak from our own diversity of perspectives, which are so powerful, so meaningful, so important to empathize the learning field and to, in that sense, re-energize our humanity for a new social learning process. So to go back to the very beginning of this project and to redefine now, sort of at the end of our presentations, but to um, re self-reflectively go back to the very beginning to redefine the notion of leadership as now a social process for collective solution generation. So that's what we need, that's what we're calling for, for. and at, at this table, everybody's welcome, and especially in the spirit of contribution that you, all of you, called for today. Everybody's here to um, give offering, and um, before I forget, Alexander, thank you very much for the poetic offering in your own humanity that showed up not only as a perspective and a position or a presentation, but a heart offering in this space. In that spirit, I would like to open up the panel uh, to the participants, to the panelists, other panelists and participants from the academy, as well as our general um, attendees and our friends from all over the world to come and participate. You can, uh, I have seen comments in the chat and I will address some of them, but also please note at the bottom of your screen that you have a Q&A and if you want to pose a question where we already have a couple of questions, um, I am going to address those. Please feel free to send your questions. We are going to go into another half an hour of conversation at least to give it some time for the conversation to develop but I also encourage speakers to look at these questions and maybe engage some of the um, attendees directly uh, you can write your answer here um, in the Q&A box or you can also um, continue conversation, offer a way in which people can, can stay in contact with you or reach out to you. So first and foremost, I would like to um, see what's going on in our chat. We got some good comments and good feedback. Um, thank you all very much and thank you for your encouraging words. I see words from Gary and I see work, words from Salihat. Thank you for participation, participating and I will go directly to the questions. Uh, this one is specifically going to Alexander. How can we increase community access to STEM in resource limited communities? Alexander, if you don't mind, a couple of minutes and maybe offer from your wonderful examples and unmute yourself, thank you. Thanks Mila. Mila, could you give me a helping hand? What, what is meant by STEM? Science, technology, um, engineering, and math. And just so you know, I'm not surprised that you're asking uh, because it's heavily science and technology laden, but these days people have definitely expanded this kind of orientation in education um, to STEAM, which adds art to STEM. And this is a very strong um, initiative in education to strengthen and scale out uh, the accessibility of science and technology, math and engineering. Um, yes, I think this is a wonderful question. And sorry, I'm just looking for the name of the gentleman, Jostas, I'm now seeing it. So thank you, Jostas, for your question. Um, well, one way that I see, and also from my own practice, to increase community access is by creating learning to innovation journeys that include the community. And that's one way. You know that usually we hold them within the educational institution and occasionally there might be an outreach project, but to include in particular, back to the point that was made of contextualization, to, con to include local communities in the activities of local educational environment. So that is one thing. The other thing is, I really would like the, to turn the question also partly around because usually we have this strange kind of understanding that the knowledge is hosted in the university or in the, in the laboratory or in the school, but equally it is hosted in the community. And that is one thing I'm recalling one particular work I'm doing in India. Um, imagine an organization called Koro near Mumbai catering to 50,000 slum women in for about 25 years now and working with them to empower these women. And we are working now together to create a community-based university. 
we say, why should a university be what we know it to be, our school? The knowledge that has been accumulated in these organizations, uh, in these households, in these communities, has its own particular worth to come to the knowledge table. And hence, I would argue also to frame this kind of rich knowledge bases more intelligently in the future. So it's not this kind of conveying knowledge to communities in need, but also bring the educational institution and the community of power in, on an eye level. And the final point I would like to bring, uh, Jostas, is um, that I see um, how to say, on the one hand, technology, when we usually speak technology, we think about hardware, we think about natural science. We do not yet sufficiently embrace social technology, new social ways of being, new social designs in the way how we understand technology. So I would like to expand the term STEM, if I may, in all humility, to bring in the social dimension into what is usually understood in a natural science perspective. And that as a whole is also wanting me to lift humanities and social sciences to a new level in equal dialogue with the natural sciences, which I think is vital for the innovation we want to see. And that will bring communities in stronger. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Alexander. I would love to open, even the question, though the question was addressed to you, I am certain that especially um, Nebosha or Faris or Asim might have uh, some input. If Please, you're most then welcome now to unmute yourself altogether, all of you, so that we can be in a forum together. And if you have any brief insight or um, contribution or addition to what Alexander was saying in relationship to this question, please uh, please join the conversation. Faris, Nebosh, and Asim, please feel free to join. I think only through distance learning, in a time when transportation and uh, presented by the speakers, in, you know, personally, is very limited. And I'm sure it will be limited for a period, certain period in future. We should really develop online teaching. This is one of the solutions. And and then again, I will add a note to that, which I I'm tying on to Faris was saying. How do we humanize and um, infuse with em empathetic and social uh, intelligence and emotional intelligence energy that field of learning online? That's going to be one of the key points, and I think we're going to have to expand the way in which we communicate, whether that's uh, by sharing poetry, sh sh sharing personal perspectives. Uh, and that's one of the things that have already been um, haunting all the conferences, and it's no wonder that we'll have to shift the way in which we engage at conferences. We started today in a very conventional way, but I'm really trying to be, bring a certain presence and energy in a way to invite your humanity forward as people who are related in your own communities, in your own uh, um, you know, professional fields, but also in your families, in your countries, in your particular contexts, in your own struggles and intensities of a daily life. I mean, we need to show up even in the, this discussion in this way. That's why I'm particularly grateful to Alexander. I am typically the one that announced a lot of personal, but that comes with the feminist agenda, I think, where the personal is quite the political. And uh, that's just a snippet of feedback. But I think this, us in building on what you are saying, it's going to be key, connecting what Faris was also saying, is going to be key how to show up in an empathetic and truly vulnerable manner to each other in any space, especially now with this, uh, with this remove with which we are dealing. So I am going to go on to the next um, question, couple of questions. We have um, a question from Ranjani, who is saying the corona pandemic has shown us the loopholes in the social system. A crucial issue I think that needs to be addressed next is the need for emphasis on intellectuality and on original thinking. What transformational leadership initiatives do we need at the intellectual level to create more Einsteins and Copernicuses? That's Ranjani with my dear colleague from the World Academy. I could go forward, but as a moderator, I'm uh, quite um, infusing the space with a lot of sound. So any of, of my panelists, would you like to go for that question?
My, Ranjani, I will take, uh, take one uh, moment to say this. I really appreciate the questions because with this question, you are indeed saying that there are many, many more Einsteins and Copernicuses as these role models that we have known out there. And what are the ways in which we can unleash human potential and um, <laughs> open up the, the, the seed of human genius or the genius, the spirit in every human being uh, in that sense. I really appreciate the question. My addition to your question is not only how to address original thinking, but also how we can develop these individuals, our individuality on a spectrum of all capacities from emotional, social, intellectual, mental, spiritual, in that sense I mean uh, at the level of universal values, at the level of consciousness. And also point another paradox here that I've discussed with some of my colleagues before, is that we have seen this divorce between consciousness and knowledge, where we intellectually derive knowledge, but the consciousness uh, exists in a sort of in a collective cloud, right? Uh, to use that analogy or metaphor of computer, uh, 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 of computing that the consciousness already comes from the space of unity and universal value um, and that the knowledge is this analytical way of dissecting the world in order to manage an order and organize reality we need to marry again in that sense arts and science empathy and mental capacities um, knowledge and consciousness and resituate them with each other in order to be able to unleash this incredible potential uh, that every day we see loss of life, but we should not be seeing um, the loss because we have the knowledge and we have a way of, of supporting life. It's the division that has been generated through knowledge and militarized knowledge, I should say, that mm -hmm. got us to, us to this place. In knowledge, but science. Humanize ourselves to rehumanize the knowledge. Uh, exactly. Thank you, Asim. And Alexander, Asim, please continue if you want to. And Alexander wanted to contribute something here. Yeah, I, I like to add to your brilliant thoughts. We do need knowledge, but not only the knowledge. We need research. And the results of the research will increase ever-growing encyclopedia of knowledge. Here we, in Corona, actual problems have terrible unsuccess of science. First of all, money, material standard of government doesn't play. The strongest medical consequence we do have in rich countries. Coronavirus doesn't recognize borders. It passes as fast as any traffic toll. Uh, we are too long involved in the trial to produce vaccine. And vaccine is the only solution. It's not treatment drug. It is business-minded more than medically. So we have a lot of, a lot of uh, scientific challenges to solve. And our academy, with all of these brilliant people as you are, are should produce level of solidarity and should produce leaders. Do you see any leader in the field of fight against coronavirus? Global leader. Give me the name. I recently analyzed. That is exactly the point, yes, of this project. Exactly. Awesome. That should come from our academy, for example. Paris Gavran Kapitan did something in Bosnia. Why small country like Croatia not poor, neither rich, has less than 100 people who died in four and a half million citizens. That is day rate in New York daily. All of these controversies, someone must finally answer. We wait for long time vaccination. We wait for long time, long time the drug, but newspaper, even serious medical journals are full of wrong information. Why? Everybody likes to be the first to publish two weeks later, you know, different opinions and so on. Very difficult to work against something in which you do not know etiology. Society, past history, remember many, even wars, 
pandemias of Spanish leap of uh, chicken and so on. Uh, however, that's what I stress in my somewhat too general uh, participation and contribution. Uh, some societies, some leading societies with global influence, only global actions are working here because Corona pandemia is negative globalization. We have countries who are very, in the past, very nicely cooperating, France and Germany, and then they close the borders. You know, we, we have many paradox in which no one proposed. In my country, every day, some scientist or someone who believe he is scientist come with a new idea. Two days later, his own institution said this is not true. So there is no agreement, and I fully agree, it's very difficult to produce agreement and global answer on questions. But while we are waiting for creativity, for new ideas, for fresh ideas, which will put us forward, coronavirus is having second generation. Because mutation happened, scientists yeah. should know. Mutation produced yeah. new virus, and he is more dangerous than the previous one. And we have no answer. Yeah. Thank you for pointing out the medical consequences of misdirected knowledge of <laughs> and a of profound vulnerability of the, of the planetary system. I have Alexander, then Faris, then Nebojša, and then we, we have other questions. We have really good questions. So please, Alexander, Faris, and Nebojša, and let's, uh, let's expand on this. Everybody's getting excited. Now is the forum <laughs> happening. And I want to, uh, Mila, just briefly Alexander. salute. Can you hear me? Yes. I think it's wonderful yes. how you come in and bring also a whole new perspective to the panel. And I love the energy of the conversation right now. I just want to point out a few things in relation to the question of Ranjani about originality. I don't think we will see incre massive increase of originality if we do not find ways also to connect to our origins. You know, have a look. I mean, we are asking for... Einstein's and Copernicus, two white Western men, we are looking for leadership as role models to, to Bill Gates and, and Soros. But I mean, the world has so much more to offer. And I, I really advocate that we look, and by the way, again, men, we need to look in a more balanced way to the originality of what it means to be human. There is a male and there is a feminine dimension, and there is utter cultural diversity. And for me, the cultural diversity colleagues, is really a key to spur global innovation, because if these different knowledge resources come into interaction, then something new can be created. The next thing which I find is super important, if we can move from the individual Einstein and Copernicus more to, do, to innovation ecologies, because similar like leadership, we will need to see that in more in more collaborative ways of creating geniuses in the future. And so I was very um, well, sad and, of course, to hear also your experience, uh, Asim, of course, about the competition that we see in today's research. Everyone wants to be the first, and it is just, to my mind, a reflection of a desolate economic paradigm that has superimposed itself on science. You know, we are competing who is the first and shows up first, rather than creating um, fields of knowledge transfer, transaction, innovation that can benefit humanity as a whole rather than the individual. Thanks for that. Faris, please, and then Nebosha. He has to unmute himself. Faris, you, you need to unmute yourself. All of my panelists, you can stay unmuted now, please. Uh, I, I'm now online. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I was uh, late two or three minutes on the beginning, and I would like just to greet all of you, all of you the Mila first you, then Alexander Nebosh and Asim. Asim is my friend and my teacher, Gloria Discipoli, Gloria Magistri. The glory of the student is glory of... Uh, teacher. One of my teachers is uh, Asim. Uh, I will uh, uh, tell a few experiences from my life uh, and working during these three or four months uh, before uh, um, due to the coronavirus. But the first of all, I would like to say that 
this world, the world which we are uh, belong, is uh, not quietly prepared for this hit of Corona, which was happened. Because when it was happened, it was very far in China. Nobody matters what was going to happen. But it, when, when it was train transferred to Italy, it was a disaster. To my to my uh, focus from my own experience, the first one. Uh, I was working uh, with the doctors who were treated the coronavirus uh, patients. So I was uh, encouraged them to stay on the front line because uh, we have a lot, a number of the doctors who were avoid, they were actually afraid of unknown disease which came in uh, our country. So I try to encourage and I think that I have some kind of a success to return them to the front line to work with this uh, corona patient. And the second one from my uh, family experience, my youngest uh, child daughter, nine years old, she, she's going to the um, German school here in Sarajevo. This is the class of 14 uh, pupils. But during these four months, she has contact, uh, I mean the physically contact uh, the girl came to our home or she went to her home only with one person. All other 12 persons, they were actually on the screen. So it means that this kind of the social meeting was disrupted completely. And this is one of the, actually my worrying what is going to happen with the other generation in all level. I mean, from the primary, secondary school, the universities, whatever, and we have to work on this. As I mentioned at the beginning, the world was not prepared on this hit of Corona. But now the efforts which you give, and Mila, you are success, successful leader of this group, real leadership, you have it. You know, it means that it means that the World Academy of Art and Science has to be one of the leaders, together with all of us and you, of course, uh, that we can offer some kind of uh, the response or perhaps other uh, or overall spread of the coronavirus to all the world. This is one of our tasks, as I understood uh, uh, good all this, our meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Faris. And I will address the question and I will tie up all the, all the questions together. Just want to make sure that Nebosha uh, uh, speaks uh, to these questions as well, but we will read them all. Okay, I'm, I'm coming back to the Ranjani's question on Einstein. She asked about uh, the way to, to obtain more Einsteins, but that comes to the question of basic research. My strong uh, belief is that that part of the chain of research and development should be stimulated in each corner of the world, in each country, whether small or rich. I'm saying this because it is usually uh, an opinion in a smaller country within the administrative circles that uh, basic science is not for us, it's for the richer and larger. We should focus on applied science and we can learn about the results of basic science from, for example, the internet. Now, since basic science is the exploration of the unknown, it means that we are limiting the, the will of people, the desire of a people to explore the unknown. I'm saying that this is not wrong. This is stupid. If you need more Einstein's, this is not the direct answer to her question, but I'm supporting very strongly the development of the whole chain of research and development from basic science to high technological development. Of course, it must be adequate, realistic. You cannot do everything in each country, but you have to have the whole chain and you must insist on basic research. Everything starts from basic research, from learning and discovering the unknown. Okay. Nebusha, that is so, so important to say how to develop the collective genius. Like I said before, the young man from college, now we're getting really personal as as we should show up uh, in our, per, you know, humanity. The young man that told me that the era of the personality is over, and this is the, the era of community and uh, education was my own son. Um, so um, I'm paying attention and I'm paying attention in a way that Nebusha, you're pointing out, that, that there needs to be democratization of knowledge, um, 
and I mean all across, intergenerational, as I point out just now, uh, interregional across the globe, and we understand, as Asim points out, that this very new conditions uh, with environment, uh, with health crises, with, as Afari said, nations left to fend for themselves as best as they can, uh, is showing us that. And most importantly, every single one of you in one way or another mentioned these more or less um, distant regions and smaller uh, perspectives only to point out that we have so much to learn and that there are no unimportant corners of the world or unimportant perspectives. And I will announce very quickly that I just came from the empire of the day. I just uh, came from the US, which is an absolute political health and economic crisis. Uh, and I'm currently um, uh, participating with you here from my native country, Montenegro, who happened to be the very first European country that is uh, virus free for a month and a half now. Um, so speaking of no inconsequential destinations and no unidirectional learning, this is co-learning, co-evolving, and Alexander mentioned co-creating. So I am going to uh, tell you that we are trying to wrap up the session. We might have um, very uh, little time, maybe nine, 10 minutes, but I do want to honor all the insights. So what I will do, I will read all the question and find questions and find the common threads and ask uh, my panelists to address them uh, sort of in, in connection and also weave with the addressing these questions, maybe your final uh, remarks for the day. But I'm also going to tell the participants that the session is recorded the, and will be featured on the channel of the World Academy of Art and Science YouTube channel. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and you can find all the questions, commentaries, and I'm of course inviting you to continue listening because the next session has already begun and it's a full of very exciting um, exchange. So after this, we've heard from our dear friend, Ann Snick, who said, I noticed a lot of, in of innovation educational initiatives. I'm working on a STEM plus project involving local pioneering communities in KU Leuven, but these pedagogical pioneers could connect more and join forces to foster the new paradigm. Could World Academy play a role in connecting them? Next, Shatrok says, hello, ladies and gentlemen, when all pharmaceutical companies are established on the basis of profit, as Asim, I think, pointed out, and the only thing that is not valuable in our time is the benefit of society and the people. Who do we want to know as a leader? Rodolfo says, we have to learn our external reality representation. I'm sorry, we have to learn or connect, I guess, our external reality representation to our internal universe representation first. Rodolfo, thank you for correlating the inner and outer inquiry that is, you know, connecting these questions. And I will quickly say, Asim called for high, Asim and Nebosha in particular called for a particular kind of in-depth and broad, uh, broadly shared and democratic research. And I will pair it up with the, with the term inquiry, coupling self-inquiry to the external research of external phen uh, phenomena is crucial here to correlate internal development and development of values in the whole person uh, with external social movements and leadership. And I will mention that indeed World Academy, this is my contribution to these questions, is looking into the ways through this very project, looking into ways in which we can develop new ways of connecting knowledge and communities of knowledge and creation and leadership with new ways of convening. We are forced now to convene online. We were hoping to meet in person, and goodness willing, we will in Geneva in October to continue this conferencing and continue this project. But the question of synthesis of knowledge and synergy of action is central to me personally, my own practice, as well as the World Academy. Please, uh, Nebusha Asim, Alexander, and Faris, thank you for your contribution, but please see if you can address these questions and also um, give your not final, but maybe uh, another, food, another food for thought to carry us forward through the day, uh, your commentary. Mila, can I 
state just with two sentences. Global problems can be solved only by global efforts. Pandemia taught us that everything is global. Virus doesn't recognize borders, travels more than, than, than anyone of us. So global efforts, global response should be that the only proper institution, truly global, highly creative with competent people is the Academy of Art and Science, for the Academy of Art and Science. From today, this excellent starting point, we should start to investigate different parameters of these complex problems. Let me give you one very personal. In Croatia, no one pregnant woman had coronavirus. No one. So is pregnancy biologically protected? Is a beautiful research. We are doing this now. Collaborative study showed that very, very seldom mothers are affected. And even if affected, no bad influence on the coming baby and the newborn babies. This is a beautiful field of research something unknown, and then we will increase knowledge with this. However, moderator, generator of this new idea should be academy. Mila, Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate your support. Paris, please. Uh, I agree with the asking that the global problems has to be actually solved by the global approach. As I mentioned before, just before, just a few minutes ago, it was uh, actually a huge problem uh, for our world and society when this coronavirus started. But now we have some kind of experiences. And I think that one of the most efforts which was given in the previous three months is actually given by the academia. We are going to work on this some more. And of course, as a think tank or the brainstorming uh, groups, we can uh, give some of the possible solutions for the further problem of coronavirus in the world. Thank you. Nebosha? Well, uh, nothing special. I've enjoyed the conversation. Uh, 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 response from the audience was excellent. And I'm just sending you my best regards till the next uh, session or sessions. Thank you so much. Alexander, please. Thank you, Mila. And it was indeed a very enjoyable session. I want to thank all of you. And I want to build on, on what uh, the opening remarks in this final round about global is the answer. And I would say yes, and we do have an opportunity. We can see a rise of global solidarity that also was spurred to to um, um, COVID-19, but we also saw at the same time an unraveling of the, the and then surfacing of the injustices that we face on the planet. We are not yet living in a world of equality. We, the global perspective is usually a Western one, and I maintain that. So when I think this great question also, we need to connect deeper, and I totally agree, and I do think that uh, the World Academy is really the place to, to take that on. But I want to build on the humanity dimension. In, for me, in conclusion, we are looking for new ways of connecting, new ways of convening our full humanity. And I absolutely believe that connection means and has to begin connecting to ourselves. Researching, one of your, your but we need to research also who we are as a species so we can show up in a new way on this planet. And, you know, I was always wondering, we have all these initiatives on the planet, why are we not connecting already for quite a long time, much, much stronger? It's because we are still, I believe, to degree caught up in a kind of, this is me and my initiative. And now we are opening up, here's an opportunity now, a catalytic opportunity to really connect on a much deeper level so that the fabric of humanity, the fabric of life can restore itself. And, um, that means one of the questions was pointing to the inner and outer. I do need, we think we need to work at the same time on the inner transformative process we are currently going through as much and the outer responses that we need to deliver. And I want to conclude with Einstein because someone evoked Einstein today. And Einstein wrote in a letter to his daughter and he asked her, the daughter, please publish it years or decades after my death. 
And there he declares that he discovered that the greatest power on the planet is not, is not uh, nuclear energy, it's love. But he said, please, if that would be released and published now, no one would understand. But now seems to be the time that we can understand it and bring this dimension more full-fledged in the way how we do research, education, how we convene, how we connect, and how we create our future. Thank you. And thank you really for a brilliant panel. Oh, thank you so much. What a delight to share a slice of life and some wonderful no space together uh, with our attendees, the ones that have posed questions, as well as those that have given their energy and their presence and their attention, which is precious. And also reminds us here that the process of unlearning is absolutely key, and I agree with her. Um, I am thrilled, Alexander, that you speak of Einstein, uh, who is in the foundation of the World Academy, but we round it off and pitch it forward into the 21st century with the note of a letter of Einstein to his daughter. I think that's really significant. Um, I would say, granted that this, um, that this panel was focused on science, youth, and education, and pitching it forward, you know, our messages to Faris' uh, daughter, or my son, or our, all of our children, and all of our relations, um, I think that it's very important to remember that science is a mental art, and art is based and sourced in profound and keen observation of the world and the self, and that this, this separation can no longer hold, as we know, no separations can any longer hold. In the time when science and scientists are being challenged, when they are being militarized or weaponized against even their own free will. We know that uh, even from the founding of the academy, we know that the science being challenged uh, in different parts of the world right now, um, in some establishments, we stand an even greater responsibility to each other as friends and as co-creators uh, to democratize the learning, to spread the knowledge, to most importantly expand the, and elevate the consciousness of all of us together for collective thriving. I'm looking forward to seeing you in another virtual space and I'm sending everybody a warm embrace and thank you till next time. You all stay well and lifted. Please. I'm the oldest here and I use my age privileged position to thank Mila. With for due respect. <laughs> conducting. Please keep us together we are a good, loyal group, and you are an excellent leader. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you for your trust in me. Yeah. Blessings to all. Thank Good you. Bye. Ja sam najljubav na, na, na jedan, <laughs> i napajem, tako da znaš.